For two decades, I interviewed the man who helped us to stop being ourselves and become who we want to be. I was fortunate enough to know him well and in many forms, as a celebrity, hermit, mentor, target of media slander, miracle worker, director of a multi-million dollar media empire, and uncultured teenage fledgling, which is how I first met him on a winter morning in Los Angeles. Most people never knew Masha Isle. They didn't meet the boy who uttered every word with perfect ignorance. They met someone else, the fully formed adult, master of the personality arts, worldly, seasoned, glowing from televisions, and presiding over his audiences like a natural-born leader. This book is my attempt to reintroduce the world to Isle. For those who knew him through a gossip and tabloids, here's a chance to meet him directly, without the pesky buzz of opinion. For devotees of his show, these talks revealed the icon as he was offstage, out of his host position. For those who haven't known Isle at all, the next generations, I hope this book serves as an authentic introduction. Next time you have the chance to get to know your neighbor, I hope you'll take it. And if you're as lucky as I've been, you may have the great luck of meeting someone as special as Ross Simonini, today's guest, who I met a few years ago when he and I lived in the same apartment building in Brooklyn. And I've had the pleasure since of witnessing and being inspired by one of the kindest, most unique, and talented people I've ever come across. A modern Renaissance man of sorts, Ross's talents run wide and deep. He's a professor at Columbia University's graduate creative writing program. He's a musician and music producer. The songs you'll hear throughout this episode are from his album, Standards Volume 1, which he produced under the name Roos, R-O-O-S, and which he has generously let us use for various episodes of this podcast. Ross is also a visual artist and a writer, a contributor to The Believer magazine, with works appearing in Freeze, Art in America, the Paris Review, and other publications. And he's a novelist, having released his debut, The Book of Formation, in 2017, a book publishers weekly called Ambitious, Strikingly Intelligent, the only book for what it's worth that I've ever read in one sitting, and a great accomplishment for Ross and a gift for all of us that is the focus of today's conversation, The Book of Formation and its creator, Ross Simonini. Thank you all for tuning in. And please enjoy. Um, also, will you sign it? Uh, sure, of course, yeah. yeah. Will you sign it with your foot? You still doing that? Yeah, of course, yeah. Sweet. <laughs> Just a classic foot signature. I actually have a specific signature I've been doing this book, but cool. not my foot, but I was ended up talking about ideas. Ross is signing a book with his foot right now. Very So this is this de- dexterously. Um, well, Ross, it's good to see you again. Good to see you. Uh, neighbor. Yeah. Old neighbor. Old neighbor. And now I was thinking on the way up here, which is cool, is that I still think of you as my neighbor. Yeah. Even though I haven't seen you in a long time and you live in California. Once a neighbor, always a neighbor. Yeah. Yeah, I think of conversation as a kind of collaboration. Yeah, you know, um, it, I definitely think of the art of conversation as well. So I, I do think conversation is a kind of art form, a daily art form. Yeah. Um, it's and when you put it down on the page, it suddenly becomes literature. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the content isn't changing there. Right. You know, I'm working on a screenplay right now of, cool. of this book, and I was trying ask you about it. to do that, trying to adapt. You know, in, in a very uh, aggressive way to the point where it may not, in many ways, re- you know, look a lot like that book. Yeah, but you'll for sure know that there's a connection. Yep, like it's almost like all the um, missing pieces from that book will be in the film. Cool. So, is is there someone on the other end that? Asked you to do this, or are you hoping to to sell it? Uh, I'm working with a director. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's awesome. 
Yeah. It was well, while I was reading it. There's was, first of all, so good. I'm a fan. It was excellent. Oh, thank you. And I want to put that out there. I know I told you that right off the bat that I've never read a book in one sitting. I'm not a fast reader, and I, but I couldn't. Put, I literally I couldn't put it down. I got a green light, and I read it. I spent all Saturday, I think it was, reading it, and I was like celebrating because I was happy for you, but I was also just excellent and really fun to read. Oh. And I was thinking the whole time that it was uh, could be a great film, and a, and a, and it. I could really visualize it while I was reading it, which I think was part of the the enjoyment of it. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah. How's it, so how does it... Uh, congratulations. Because I remember when when we were living, was that a few years ago, and you were uh-huh. working on a novel that I didn't... You, you, we didn't really talk about what it was about. But but was it, what was the experience like having published your first novel? The experience of actually publishing it, yeah, or just all of it, of getting up there. to it and getting it. I imagine to change along the way, and then you finally oh, yeah, get through. Yeah, yeah. Cha- it definitely changes. That's yeah. good. Yeah, it's fun to make radical changes up until the last minute. Yeah, because nothing's ever done. Yeah. You're just exhausted with it at some point. Um, my path of getting there was long, seven years of. Yeah. I see what Sid says. That's when I. <laughs> said, I'm going to write a book. Mm-hmm. And then it took about seven years uh, to do it. But I would also drop it for maybe a year here and there. Yeah, I was, as you remember, on tour a lot yeah, at that yeah. point. Music. Music, yeah. yeah. So you know, there would be years where uh, you'd be touring most of the time, or m- not most of the time, but off and on, you mm-hmm. know, a few months here, off, a few months here. And... It makes writing a book somehow harder if you don't have longer stretches of, of time to really yeah, yeah, jump into I something. Bet. So I, you know, tweak it then. But um, it wasn't until I until I stopped touring that I could put the energy into, you know, making that kind of long gesture in the yeah, book. Yeah. And Melville House is who decided to put it out. Mm-hmm. Um, although they were, I had a peculiar relationship with that process, uh, if this is of interest, that where yeah. the typical m- method of, of getting your book pu- published is uh, is you get an agent first. Yeah. So I contacted many agents, uh, s- most of who, who, they weren't interested yeah. at, at all. And some were, and I worked with them to refine the book a bit, mm. but ultimately they weren't interested in, in taking me on. So then I just decided to go to publishers directly and Melville House was the first one I sent it to and only one because they were they were uh, a, a friend of a friend kind uh, of situation. Yeah. And and how did you describe it to them? Do I remember didn't describe it. Oh. I just sent it. Oh. I may have I think I may have worked up a little pitch. Yeah. How would you describe it? I would hate to describe it. Even the description <laughs> on the back, I feel, is is reductive. But yeah. I would say on the show that my what I was trying to do was write a fictional philosophy, hmm. and the narrative around that wasn't the point to me, but the ideas that the narrative contained, mm-hmm. and that's where it started from. But every time you describe like a narrative work, you talk about the story. Yeah. So for right. me, uh, I oftentimes bristle against that. Yeah, I know what you mean. I was trying to, exp- I was talking to my brother recently. He asked me what uh, 2001 Space Odyssey is about because I was somehow it came up I referenced it and he, and he just asked me what it was about. And I said, I, I don't even, I could tell you what happens and like, right. Like the, the plot, but it's not, that doesn't really tell you what it's about, right? There's, yeah. I mean, there's so many um, books and films that are really dealing with other things, but the narrative is sort of consequential of the medium being a time-based mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, two thousand and one. I mean, it's really telling that story is not helpful at all <laughs> to understanding <laughs> yeah. what it is. Right. I, I could say that that's true of so much work, yeah, you know, absolutely, and. But at the same time, it's kind of what you have to do. Yeah. So if I were to describe it here, I, I would say it was it's a philosophy of 
personality transformation told through an alternative history of United States pop culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's called the book of formation. Yeah. There's so much in there. And I think that's part of what's fun about storytelling is that, and and particularly that you can plant within the dialogue of a character, say an entire cultural philosophy or, Mm -hmm. or the ideas floating around in the culture. What, what were, Let's dig into it, because what were some of the, the themes that you were experiencing in real life that you wanted to draw attention to in this book? Hmm. I think I'd seen, up until that point in my life, I'd seen the most important thing I had to do was shape myself. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what school teaches you how to do what the world is encouraging you to do mm-hmm. at that point. You're all kind of potential, right? That you're trying to mold. Right. And the way I would assume you would mold that is through willpower, you know, mm-hmm. to, you, through focusing your mind, focusing your body on, you know, some goal or some state right. that you want to be in. It seemed like the kind of thinking that was a good expression of our meritocracy as a culture. Mm-hmm. And I was deep in it. And I wanted to play with that because I recognized it as a dangerous idea and one that you could push to a certain limit. A lot of this is reflected in self-help, self-help culture yep. and, um, you know, the... I'm trying to think of the... Uh, What's it called when you monitor every aspect of your body? There's a there's a term for this. When you what? You monitor every aspect of your body. You know, you're monitoring your oh, blood monitor. glucose. Uh, your, no. There's a whole movement of it, yeah. right? And uh, and I felt that that was another expression of this mm-hmm. idea. And I wanted to start being suspicious of that myself. Yeah. And so one of the ways that this expresses itself is through uh, systems of thought, systems of belief. That could be a, a religion. It could be a diet. Yep. It could be um, exercise regime. Right. It could be uh, any kind of worldview, really, that becomes programmatic and rule based, mm-hmm. where you're really doing it to for the betterment of yourself to create some pure sense of who you are. Right. So through this book, I really wanted to set up a system like that. You yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. And then to be able to uh, to fall in love with it, and then also to reject it, yeah, simultaneously. Yep. And you did that beautifully. And part of the th- one of the many things I loved about it was that. Uh, well, f- first, for listeners, if you haven't read it, you should read it, the book of formation. <laughs> but it, to give you some context, it's there's a. There's an interviewer who's the narrator, and he is, uh, over the course of 20 years, interviewing a, uh, let's call it a self-help celebrity type person who has a, a way of life that he is uh, on the airwaves and the screen teaching uh, uh, people how to do. So a movement, think of it as like a self-help movement. And what was so fun about it, it's so, it's so timely and, and relevant in... Uh, but also you didn't, I didn't feel as a reader that it was that you were saying what was wrong or right. The interviewer is kind of skeptical, but also interested. And so you walk the line of what I think is fascinating is like the idea of self-help. Sure, that sounds like a healthy thing. Uh, self-improvement, you should try to get better, I guess. So that makes, makes sense. It's helpful and healthy, but it's also dangerous because if you're obsessed with improvement or change or, or betterment or whatever it is, then you're also implying that what you are right now is not good enough. And then how, and then what does that mean? If you're constantly telling yourself that for your whole life mm-hmm. and then there, and then this obsep- obsession with, uh, and I guess this is as old as time, but the premise of a savior or, or a, a figure who can say, look, here I am, I'm unconventional. And I have a way of living that you should buy into. 
Yeah. And then we sort of we're sort of addicted to that to that. Yeah, addicted that's a good word, yeah. It's easy you you can stop making decisions. Yes. And decisions are one of the hardest parts about life yep. is that we're constantly in a situation where we have to decide. Even more so now, perhaps, yeah. than in the past, uh, because I think decisions are addictive in that way. You, once you make it, it feels good, mm-hmm. but we're always just creating more and more options for tea in the grocery store, you know? Yep. So, yeah, I think uh, a, lot of, a lot of this is about relieving the weight and burden of decision-making. Yeah. Uh, and... And that's what a system is about, right? Every time you make a choice, you you expend a little energy. Mm-hmm. So I often think about the Buddhists, and you know, in in certain monasteries where where they will walk through a door with the same foot every time, yeah, and at the same time of day, yeah. And it seems at at first it seems like that would be very. Mm, regimented and strict Mm -hmm. and would require a lot of choice making, very careful, deliberate choice making. But after a while, it goes away. Mm -hmm. And then you have all this space and energy left. And that's where you can start to fill fill your brain with enlightenment as you make space in that way. Because you're you weren't spending energy making the the decision. Exactly. And if you have enough of those throughout the day you can get closer to some way of being that is less annoying sure. in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like if you know, for example, you know what you're going to wear the next day. So you wake up, it's just you put it on without deliberating about mm-hmm. what to wear. So you save some energy there. I'm constantly working to comb through my life and remove those little decisions. Yeah. The ones that I make every day but I find to be unnecessary, they accumulate mm-hmm. it's like a plaque in your mm-hmm. life yeah it's it's really interesting because the we want we want to know the answers so that we don't have to make decisions yeah and often a religion or a or a self-help leader is the portal into what we think will will allow us to do that so they can give us a way of life that we just we just follow mm-hmm. and to some extent that that's helpful but it can also be as you mentioned then you're sort of foregoing your own autonomy in a way if you're just blindly following. And, and I think your book nicely sort of un, uncovers the potential danger there. Well, nature is not a system, even though we call it a system. So what do you mean by that? That a system is something that humans come up with and we, mm-hmm. we decide that things are systems. Right. Nature is chaotic yeah. and we create patterns or we see patterns and we decide that there are systems yeah. but um, but the system as an idea is very human not that science is wrong right. they come up with pattern and they, they again they perceive patterns and they come up with systems based on those patterns that's yeah, yeah. I, I understand that but I think it's often a way of simplifying or reducing right you know and you're failing to look at certain aspects of of you know what's happening to isolate the things that do have patterns yeah and, yeah yeah um, so and I, and I do think science is another one of these systems mm-hmm. as well mm-hmm. you know another one that we get a little drunk on and we we start it, at first it seems like maybe a system of truth but then it becomes more and more a system of belief because there, there's a lot of belief in science that we yeah. don't really acknowledge right. you know there's a like we're told about laws of nature, mm-hmm. things like this. This is a belief that this thing is always this way, has always been this way. You know, I'm I'm sounding like I have some anti-science rhetoric. No, here. no, no. I don't but think I'm so. I'm just saying that science, I think, is functions in this way as well. Yeah. There's no such thing as a system, I think, that doesn't function right. in this way. So you sort of, I think it speaks to the our craving for understanding and simplifying mm-hmm. chaos, and which I think is what religion helps religion or ritual helps with too. Yeah. It kind of places you in the in the chaos in a way that you can uh live with. Mhm. Uh, and ideally it is a helpful benevolent thing. But it can also be and I think you again nicely done in the book is that you can't I couldn't tell if 
Masha and his mother were were benevolent or or malicious or or not malicious necessarily but or manipulative you know uh, yeah. and if if they're messing with their followers or if they genuinely believe what they're preaching and so they the whole time you're asking I was asking myself that and I think that and then that makes you just think about all the things you follow or all the things you, believe, you take as your beliefs mm-hmm. as if it's a form of control or if it's actually a a form of liberation um in in most cases I think that's probably true too with uh people aren't really one way or another you know when books or narratives mm. reduce people to a certain way, that's a function of the story. But right. I think uh, I think that people are very complex. Yeah, and and I hope the book gets at that as well. That that the idea of having many personalities within you at once and being right. able to explore those, it's a way of saying it's okay to contradict yourself. Yeah, we don't have to. Our lives don't have to be like thesis statements, right? Where we we remain cohesive with our uh, aesthetic and yeah. linear you know, ideology. career trajectory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, you can you can be many people within a lifetime. I think that it's a Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard quote where he says, um, "You know, there's there's no reason why every day I wake up I should." make the choice to be me. Right. And, but we do yeah. every day. Uh, I just butchered that quote, I'm sure. Too. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, and, <laughs> but I think about that most days, that yeah. am I making this choice to be, because it's truly how I feel and how I would intuitively react to this situation? Right. Or am I making it to avoid contradicting something I said in the past yeah. so that I might appear foolish right. or that I might um, invalidate something that was done or said in the yeah. past, which is, I mean, f- that's a ridiculous reason to try to maintain some consistency. But it happens all over the place. I mean, just because you did something yesterday, you wake up tomorrow and then probably what you're doing that day is a reaction or a pr- uh, trajectory of what you did yesterday. Mm-hmm. And then that compounds over your lifetime. Yeah. It's like if I went to law school, that means I have to be a lawyer. But you don't you don't. Right. And it's a it's a sunk cost that you went to law school, but mm-hmm. that doesn't mean that you have to keep doing it if it's not suiting you. I I think a lot of it has to do with the place you're in too. Yeah. yeah. And the more it, you change up the place around you, whether it's through traveling or moving, mm-hmm. the more you feel how easily you could let your the definition of who you are slip a little bit, yeah. and try try to be something a little bit over here, a little bit over right. there, and I think that's a very exciting feeling. Definitely, and it seems like I mean, Masha. It seems like in the book, uh, the most interesting or one of the interesting things about him as a character is that he's you're opening up the reader to the idea that he's, I think you call him the great generalist. He's a generalist. He's a, he's, he's, his focus is on the premise of newness. Mm -hmm. And so therefore he's always relevant. Like his, that's what he's telling you. That's what he's preaching. The the ongoing evolution of a person. Uh, I think our culture really worships newness. Yeah. I mean, youth, Obviously, is is worshipped at this point in history mm-hmm. very much. It probably always is to some degree. Yeah. But especially right now in pop culture yeah. in the last 50, 60 years. Yeah. And I think newness in other forms is equally attractive to yeah. people. It's something again to be celebratory of, but also to be wary of mm. that, that we have that that tendency. Oh 
did you learn through writing it? I would say that the writing of it is different than the creation of the ideas behind it. Mm -hmm. And I would say that those came many years earlier and that, that this book, if I were to actually talk about the entire period it took to write, it would be more like... 12 to 15 years. Mm. That's because I th started doing a series of experiments on myself in my early 20s that they don't exactly mirror what's happening in the book. Yeah. But they're of the same flavor. Mm. I did try one that I wrote about, one method in my early 20s where I spent three years only consuming things I dislike. So whether that's food, uh, friends, whether that's experiences, film, music, so you, books. You actively sought things you don't like. All things, as much as possible. Whenever I was aware that I didn't like something, I would move towards that. What, Smells. What was the idea there? The idea was that up until that point in life, which for me was college, mm -hmm. coming out of university, the primary way we use to define ourselves and do that molding of the self that we were talking about earlier yeah. was taste and what it is that you like mm -hmm. and what it is that you don't like. Mm -hmm. Some people, you know, define themselves more by what they don't like, other people use that less but certainly by what you like whether it's sports or punk music mm -hmm. or you know you can name off a thousand yeah. different you know uh and that becomes your signifiers yeah. and that becomes who you are right yeah. and and as you grow more complex in defining yourself by what it is you like you create more and more signifiers mm -hmm. so maybe uh you have sort of like your network of things that you like and you find that to be some perfectly balanced system yeah. that defines who you are. Right. To the point where we like Facebook and uh, yeah. I think of dating apps, right? Mm. What's the thing that you list on yeah. the, you know, to get people to find people is is, uh, is what you like, right. Right? right? And that's how people become friends and yeah. start to, you know, start relationships yeah, yeah. and get married and have yeah. kids, right? Everything. So, yeah. to a certain degree, this is really important in our culture. And I felt at that point that I was a little fed up with defining myself by a set of. I was an artist too, so mostly aesthetic choices. You know, mm. I think I always having to kind of locate myself, you know, amongst culture in mm. that way. So I thought maybe if I were to begin to push against that, then I could get to the point where I was free mm -hmm. from defining myself uh, in, in, in this sort of cultural context. And then I would be able to move forward a little bit looser mm -hmm. with you know, who I was and my personality. And, um, and that was, I think, uh, one of the first exercises I employed to loosen up my own personality. I was just bored by myself. Hmm. 
at so, that point. So that was a way for you to kind of challenge the, open up your identity, I guess, to evolve in a new way. Yeah, to to at least loosen up. Yeah, yeah. What it could be. Right. I didn't have something in mind that I wanted mm-hmm. to move towards right. yet. It was just about shaking off the convention. The, yeah, and I think it gets harder as you get older. Yeah. You know, I think every year we burrow into a hole or we, you know, add one more, you know, kind of signifier or shed one and, and we're always kind of creating this around taste and, and and it doesn't even just have to be about, you know, the aesthetic taste, but it could just be about I mean, as I mentioned, people, that's a huge part of it. And um, you know, what kind of sheets you like to use, yeah. what kind of exercises you like to do, everything, right? Yeah, where you speak, what and, you talk about. Yeah, ev- everything. It, it it comes down so um I think once you start investigating what your real feelings are on, on some of these choices, you realize that maybe you were just trying to avoid making a choice and mm. you just decided on this aesthetic cha- choice, you know, to, that's what I found a lot in this, yeah. in this experience is that whereas the, the less I declared that I didn't like something and the more I just forced myself to do it, the more I realized I didn't really care, yeah. at, at le- at, you know, <laughs> at the very least I didn't care. I didn't yeah. have a very strong opinion. Right. And then a lot of times I learned to like something, yeah. you know, I guess a very acquired kind of taste. Yeah. So that must have been freeing, I would imagine. Uh, I very much so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that I think was the beginning of the ideas in this book. So um, I think that's where I learned a lot. And then, and then you know, in the in the context of this book, a lot of those ideas are applied toward illness mm-hmm. and how you would treat illness by changing who you are. Mm. And that is that's sort of taking the idea to a, a certain extreme. Yeah, seeing if it's possible. But I mean, they say things like people with multiple personalities, right, do not have the same allergies in their various personality states. Wow. So who the who we are and what the body is and that relationship is is a big mystery. Yeah. There's no system there, you know. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. is some mystery that 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 is um, as deep as they get mm-hmm. is who we are and. And I think the old idea of that is having some kind of a soul. Yeah. But I do think that is not as relevant in culture anymore. And we're seeking for ways to locate it. Yeah. Yeah. Touched, touched on a few things there that I, I'm glad that, because I wanted to get into these, is uh, sickness and the, uh, the the narrator, the interviewer in, in the book is is ill, sort of a mysterious illness that they can't figure out. And that's going hand in hand with... Uh, Masha and company promoting this idea of, of wellness through uh, the premise of locating and uh, bringing out your personality, your P, the, the personality movement. Um, and so, yeah, let's let's talk more. Uh, let's talk more about that. The, so, personality sort of is a proxy or a synonym to soul, and it seems like that's dis- that's sort of the crux of the of the story is how do you bring that out? How do you, you, you mentioned potential earlier as a student molding potential and how, um, Masha sort of has this power to encourage people to, to look into that and how, the, like, so what's going on there? Personality to me seemed like the, the contemporary word choice mm. in place of soul. Yeah. Where if, if, our cultural idea of what a human being really is, what is the the person, the the figurehead, the artist, the celebrity, it's a kind of personality. Mm. And we're not really recognizing them for having a soul. Like yeah. we're not interested in that as a culture. Mm. But we are very interested in what their personality is, how they present themselves. Definitely. What the performance of them of their personality is yeah. every day, right? And how that changes, and and we're increasingly interested in this. I mean, I think yeah. all social media and reality television, it's all really just aimed towards us watching someone's personality, uh, you know, move through the world and what happens to it, and mm-hmm. 
it, the soul, I'm not sure that we're watching that closely. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, I think there are certainly some cases in society where we look at the soul, but um, this book was very much set in, in American culture, mm -hmm. pop culture, mm -hmm. and it was concerned with what that is as a system and what the things are it values. Yeah. And I think that is personality. So that's why that word, I think, mm -hmm. um, is best suited for that that task that it has. It doesn't mean to suggest that the soul isn't there. Right. It's just that that's not really... The way we talk about it. How we're thinking of ourselves. Yeah. The balance of a ritual. I was reading... Um, I am reading To a God Unknown, Steinbeck. And there's a conversation between Joseph, the protagonist, and his brother, Thomas. And they're talking... A lot of the book is about mystery and ritual. It's sort of inventing, you know, inventing your own rituals. And... And the, and the characters are sort of knowingly doing that. And they're sort of like, I know it doesn't mean anything, but I'm still, I still believe that this tree is my father in this case. Uh, and, and then one brother said, I just don't believe in ritual because it's a trap. It's, you know, one brother was looking at it as a way to give his life meaning and direction. And the other one saw a ritual as a, as a trap. And it's just, a, you know, talk about dialogue. It's, a, it's probably like two lines in the book. But it like in that conversation, sort of encompasses the theme, the, the broader theme, and I, I couldn't help but make the connection to, your, your book, the book of formation, because it is like you, you're constantly, having the reader question, if it's if it's BS, if it's a dangerous, uh, thing that they're preaching, or if it if it can be liberating. And ultimately, I think it's up to the, to the. It's both to you, right? Yeah, I, th yeah. I don't think it is one or the other. Yeah. I think. There are many situations that could be defined from different perspectives right. in either way. Yeah. And at different times in your life, maybe the same situation is a problem or, you know, a medicine. Mm -hmm. you, you know, it, it it can really change. And I love that. Yeah. You know, I think that that is nice to remember. Absolutely. That um, we don't have to, um, we don't have to just, Li limit what something can be or what um, our, what our reaction to something right. can be is. So, yeah, I, I really like the bothness. Yes. I think that's, uh, that's why the book is told in conversation because a true conversation is about capturing two perspectives and creating one thing out mm -hmm. of those two perspectives, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that they're inextricably tied together right you know the conversation requires both people from both sides right so I like that idea as well that that uh, that that maybe the form expresses that in yeah. its best moments definitely and and like any art or literature does is it uh, portrays the gray the gray areas mm -hmm. and it uh, of sort of brings up the idea that we're all sort of walking on a tightrope of going one way or the other. And, and at best, it reminds you that you're at the helm and that you probably do have potential to go mm -hmm. a million different ways. But you also can go, you can sort of choose. And that's, I think that's ultimately the best, the most exciting and inspiring re reminder, mm -hmm. uh, you know, about how to go through your life with, with that kind of intention and awareness that it could go in a lot of different ways, mm -hmm. depending on how you're looking at it and experiencing it. Uh, so yeah, so let's talk more. Okay, so the the narrator is an interviewer. He's a journalist. Uh, so you're, what I loved about that is it kept it fresh because I say half the book is his him writing, more mm -hmm. traditional writing, and then the rest of it is is an interview uh, transcript. Mm -hmm. So what was wh why did you do that? That's the form that I've largely written interviews in. Yes. Yeah. You know, you provide some context, and then you have the dialogue. Mm -hmm. And you know, I I've done a lot of interviews as a journalist, and I like that form. Yeah, same. But the form of the whole book was a really stolen for me from. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they they really look formally pretty different, but the concept of it was stolen from a, an actual book of interviews with the artist Francis Bacon uh. by David Sylvester. Hmm. And it is, 
interviews with Bacon over a couple decades mm. about his art making practice and it becomes a kind of biography because you see him moving throughout time yeah. and how his you know ideas change and um, in some cases maybe contradict each other yeah and I really love that about about the book and I and I enjoy reading dialogue mm. I find jo- dialogue very satisfying me too um, so that's why I you know Right, do interviews a lot is yeah. because I just I find it a pleasant reading experience. Yeah. So, uh, and I think the interview is suited to express certain things that that writing, you know, traditional monologue writing yeah. is not really suited to to express. Well, it's more spontaneous, certainly. Yeah, it is more a loose, natural, I guess. more casual. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's very hard to do on the page, but yeah. I, I think it's um, when it when that's right to me that's the best absolutely so and then the so the back and forth throughout as a it's you know 10 sections mm. and uh, it goes back and forth from written to spoken mm-hmm. and i i like that as a kind of dialogue right between these two forms yeah you know between the written and the spoken and to also show that that actually i i think in where we can locate these different personalities of who we are it is in the different expressions of ourselves. Yeah, yeah. And two of those are the written language and, and spoken language, mm-hmm. which are very different. I, yeah. They're almost separate dialects. Yeah. There are words we'd write that we would never say. Yeah. There are turns of phrase we'd use in our you know, writing or, or ways of organizing ideas right. that we would never do in our, in our spoken right. language. Right. And we don't tend to analyze our spoken language mm-hmm. that much. We tend to analyze the written and think about it. The spoken, we kind of just leave, you know, I mean, no one ever teaches you how to speak right. exactly. Uh, you're taught how to write and then you sort of learn to speak through osmosis. Yeah, through mimicry too. Yeah, yeah. but we really develop, I think, two different yeah, expressions of, of who we are mm-hmm. through those two forms. So by going back and forth in these two two forms you can and and these two um uh methods of language delivery you arrive at a more kind of prismatic view of who a person could be or or at least a double-sided one yeah yeah it's almost like the 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 pro or the the non-interview sections of the book are sort of like the narration and then once you i always i liked every time you got back into the interview the uh the pace changed Mm-hmm. The feeling of the experience changed. You can feel the uh, kinetic energy of a conversation. Yeah, I was really in the written sections trying to be extremely written. Yeah. And so I was. Beautifully even, written, by the way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I was almost trying to parody the New Yorker style yeah. of writing, which sure. is, you know, a pretty prescribed style of writing mm-hmm. and a very written one. Yeah. You know, um, I enjoy it. I like that form. That's what I, I like writing in it. But it's it felt very, very much like the the be, one of the better expressions of the journalistic written tone yeah. that's out there, yeah. and one you know that's very contemporary. And that and then that would I think contrast very nicely against mm-hmm. you know a dialogue. So. Yeah, and with your experience podcasting, doing interviews for the Believer. Uh, you obviously you have a lot of experience doing interviews. What? Do, how do you think about it uh, as a journalist, as an interviewer? What What makes a good interview, and how do you approach them yourself when you're doing the interview? I like conflict in an interview really? to some degree, some kind of conflict. Yeah. I don't know if it always has to be the same kind. Mm. I like certain kinds, but I, I like for there to be. The feeling that the person is having a conflict with themselves, maybe about mm. a question, mm. or that the interview itself is in a state of conflict. Mm. So, and that can be very subtle. Yeah. So, so like some, a disagreement. Mm, it, that's one expression yeah. of it, but I rarely do, I okay. do that. Yeah, because I, I never um, sense that. No, I I think there are people who like that kind. Yeah, you know, they right. love to pepper someone with questions. And no, for me, it's more like finding ways of asking things or finding questions that put the other person on their toes mm. and 
sometimes it's, as I said, the situation where the person isn't someone who normally gives interviews, yep. especially like people who are, um, they tend to resist interviews, at least of certain kinds, or they'll critique your questions a lot. I get a lot of people like that. Very, um, a lot of artists with uh, very specific ideas and they, when I ask them a question, if I use the wrong word, or not even the wrong word, but it, it seems as if I use if I use any word, the method they're going to take is to critique the question rather than to answer it. Interesting. And I like that. Yeah. I, I like that, that it shows that they're engaging with Definitely. the question in, that, in a creative way. Often we're not thinking about the way we mm -hmm. express something. So you might, it happens to me all the time. What it comes out of my mouth isn't necessarily what I was feeling. Mm-hmm. <laughs> maybe I didn't even know I couldn't put the words to what I was feeling and then I say something that's not even really representative of what I meant right <laughs> which is why where writing can be good because you you have to sort of iron it out crystallize yeah. your thought that, I mean they're both great mediums it's yeah. nice to have both I yeah. wouldn't want to lose either right but I think it's nice to pay attention to the spoken medium a little more definitely and and not not just to refine it in the way that you would refine writing yeah but to recognize it as a beautiful art form for what it is. Absolutely. Words like, um, you know, or a lot of these modifiers, kind of, sort of, yep. all sorts of things that Famous we say. Famous in our generation. Uh, but I don't see them, or like is yeah, another one. Yeah. I use all of these. Most people I know use all of mm -hmm. them. They're not problems. They're helpful because I think that they function like, spoken punctuation mark and they serve a musical function i yeah. think that that we need i think if, if you ever hear someone just read something off a page or speak in a very crisp uh tonally neutral way mm -hmm. it sounds uncomfortable definitely i and i i know for some audiobooks i have problems with that which is why earlier i yeah. was saying that yeah, yeah. the audiobook thing is difficult because a lot of times if someone's reading in just the wrong pitch mm -hmm. i it throws me off definitely so it's just to say that i think we're doing so much more really working with sound when we're speaking yeah than just language right and so a lot of those likes and ums and yeah and these throwaway words these are actually serving uh to help along the energy of the conversation in some way and Certainly. i think they actually have meaning in certain instances like there if you break down what is you know you know is Someone are checking you with in. Me? Are you yeah. with me? Yeah, right? Yeah. Do you do you understand what I'm saying? Right. Why would someone say that more? Well, someone might say that more because they feel less understood, sure. right? And someone who says like all the time. When you're saying like, it's because you're not comfortable directly pointing at something. Yes. You're looking for what you're what you're trying to say. Right. Yeah. You're, yeah. You're either searching for it or you don't want to. You're softening it. Exactly. Yeah. You're softening. You don't want to point at the thing so harshly. Yeah. And so you want to say it's kind of like this thing. Right. It's not that thing. Yeah. And what? so if you look at why someone would build a sentence that way and, and why would they soften this word when they're saying it to you? Was right. It because of them, because of you. There's all sorts of, uh, you know, layers of complexity in the way we talk. That Definitely. Really, I mean, obviously as a podcaster, you'd be, you know, tuned to that. Like yeah. when you when you're listening back to these things and editing them too, you really begin to pick up on, on the way people speak and how they, how they insert meaning in all sorts of other ways besides just the words.
this as you're going back you listen you 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 realize how you speak which yeah you become much more uh aware of the way you express questions or comments and um it reminds me of the 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 idea of preparing for a a conversation with an interview you, you know you want to do some preparation for the types of questions you want to ask, or in this case, if there's a certain work that you want to talk about, you want to have looked at it, you know? And so, but why it's a fine line because you also want it to be a, a natural conversation. And so it, it, it typically, in a, if we weren't recording this, it would be interesting to know, uh, to, I wonder how much different it would have been if we weren't, you know, if we didn't have the device of an interview to kind of guide us. But, um, so I'm always trying to figure out like what like how much to prepare uh so that it sound so that it can be a natural conversation because you don't want to go in totally blindly necessarily because then it'll be sort of all over the place but you also don't want to pre- prepare so heavily that you're like trying to script it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you I think there's an all uh Alan Alda the actor had a quote that always stuck with me as a real real listening or real conversation is the willingness to be changed. Mm-hmm. Or as if you're if you're if you come in already knowing what you think and what you're gonna say, then nothing nothing really happened. And so like when you mentioned conflict earlier, I was thinking of and I agree with you in the sense that it's uh the best conversations are the ones where you're actively discovering things together. And that requires intention and, and, and presence. Yeah. Yeah, by conflict I mean it in I guess the artistic definition of it. That there's a it's not so smooth and easy that there's nothing to hold on to. There's, um, you want a little, little darkness in there, a little tweak of, of some grain of sand, you know, to, to make it a little more interesting, give it some texture. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's, anyway, I don't mean personal conflict. Yeah. I rarely do that. Yeah. Um, and conflict might not be the best word for it. I, I also, can accept that, but you know, when I do interviews, I often use flow charts hmm. rather than um, sort of bullet point questions, so, and I'll f- use different ideas in those kind of bubbles that you would use in a flow chart, right? And I'll, I'll, I'll have multiple options off of where a, an idea can go. So we cool. could talk about golf carts. Yeah. And then one way we could talk about golf carts, you know, would be to talk about <laughs> how much fun they are to drive on yeah, a quite on an empty golf cart. Yeah. And um another way would be to talk about, you know, how dangerous they are. And yeah. you could get in an accident and hurt yourself badly. Yeah. Um as I did when I was a child. Not badly, but hurt myself. Oh wow. I was in a runaway golf cart. Wow. You know. What um, age? Like very young, like yeah. six. Um, I don't know who you're running from. I wasn't running from anybody. I just I was sitting in it, and oh. it just it, it it began rolling down a hill. Oh wow! Yeah. Um. But uh, so golf carts yeah. can be dangerous. Everybody, <laughs> yeah. small children. Keep it in mind. Um. And yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So I I think that the flowchart model often allows me to stay loose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and not to commit to a certain line of questioning but to see it as a you know constantly branching i like that forking yeah possibility a lot of different platforms from which to leap exactly yeah and if you sort i like that a lot and then you you prepare enough and you have enough ideas of what you might talk about that you can then be spontaneous Mm -hmm. versus being blindly spontaneous and we won't won't probably get anywhere yeah yeah and you don't go down every branch you just you just think ahead to some branches, yeah, so that you can, to some degree, prepare for right the path the conversation might take. Right, but uh, yeah, at best, I feel like it is a. It's a. I keep saying spontaneous, but the, you listen to conversations that are very lively, and you can feel that they are both, or if there's two people, that they're both kind of committed to to finding some sort of harmony in their uh, search for whatever it is they're trying mm-hmm. to explain. Or, or discover together. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So like an example, Tom. When you interviewed Tom York, maybe this is too long ago. But like, what what would you 
Or you don't have to use that example. But Definite conflict l- there, right? I mean, yeah. he he is a person known to resist interviews. Is he? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, it's part of what defined who he was, mm-hmm. I would say, in the first decade or so of his career is that he resisted interviews. Mm. And he still does. He doesn't give that many, but yeah. he's obviously such a massive musician right. at this point that he has given yeah. a tremendous amount. But, you know, there's a documentary about that band and uh, meeting people is easy. And a large degree of that documentary is about how much they dislike or are uncomfortable with the press and the portrayal uh, yeah. of who they are and the woes of being you know depicted mm-hmm. in some sort of way in the media so there was conflict in that situation to begin with yeah, yeah. With, with him and that's what i liked about it that's what drew me toward him is yeah. that there would be that hurdle right at the beginning sure we have to get over that and then i think it went quite well yeah. so my my task was just to find other ways of talking to him where he would respond and, right. and we could actually have a conversation right yeah, because I would imagine that. I mean, I don't, I don't know him, but I would imagine that his resistance is to more of the traditional press, the press conference, not really having a conversation, just sort of drilling you with questions. But I imagine that someone as talented and creative as him would probably love real conversation. Yes, and, I, I think he does. I think it's it's not that he doesn't like conversation. Right, right. It's that the nature of press is often yeah not conversation yeah yeah it's, which is again back to our evangelism of podcasting is yeah, that it's yeah, it's yeah. uh it can be just an open real conversation and that's yeah. why it's fun because you don't i had never seen that on the traditional media mm-hmm. you know there's no agenda no yeah um well that's great thanks again for doing this oh of course yeah this has been it's fun to re- to to see you and, yeah great to, see to you. talk about it um is there anything else you want to you want to cover? I feel I feel like we got a lot. How long did we just talk for? Oh, an hour, hour and ten minutes. Right. There's there's other. Are you gonna edit it at all? Uh, maybe. Okay. Yeah, I mean. I had some flubs, I'm sure. So. Yeah. If I usually edit it a bit. Uh, sometimes I don't edit it much. Sometimes. I'm, 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 I'm two hours. That was Ross Simonini. Thank you for tuning in. Take a look at Ross's website for more information at R O S S S I M O N I N I dot com. That is Ross Simonini dot com. And go get the book of formation and read it and enjoy. Thank you to Aaron Mason, my wonderful creative partner and C.F. Watkins for the artwork, and we will see you. We will connect with you next time on the Jalapeno Podcast. This is Ty McDonald signing out for the moment. Take care.